Look, listen, learn. The Tale of Monty's Will Thanks for helping me to write this will, Conrad. I could not have done it without you, said Monty excitedly. It was no trouble at all, my friend, replied Conrad, who had a pleased look on his face. Suddenly a sad countenance gripped him, and he continued. It will be sad to see you go. You have been a good man, but I hate to see you suffer like this. Monty coughed twice before replying. I wish I could see the expressions on their silly faces when they hear the contents of this will. They are excellent pretenders. The rumors prove true. They think they will claim my mansion when I die. Yet they have inherited millions of dollars a year ago and chose to remain in that small thatched house for others to pity them. Conrad chuckled when he saw what Monty wrote beside each of their names. Monty was too weak to laugh, but a look of pleasure stretched across his face. I will also include an endno, said Monty. They will never put foot on this plantation ever again. Monty died a few weeks later from a really bad flu. He had recently returned to the beautiful island called Santo Monaco where he owned a large plantation. His family members were good caretakers there while he was away. They took great care of the property as though it belonged to them. Monty was often heard promising them different things he earned. The members of the small rural community considered Monty to be a kind-hearted man because on frequent trips prior to his illness, which led to his demise, he would take souvenirs and other small tokens for them to enjoy. Everyone looked forward to his return, and he received a warm welcome home party that was the talk of the island. Monty had no offspring. He was the only child for his parents who died when he was only nine years old. He migrated to Florida to reside with his foster family. He inherited the plantation from his paternal grandfather because he was their only grandchild. He made frequent visits to the island when he became a man. He fostered great relationships with his cousin Susanna, who he affectionately called Sue and his aunt Margaret. They lived close to the plantation in a small ancient thatched house. In Monty's absence, they made sure to visit the plantation regularly to clean the mansion, tend to the garden, and take care of the animals that strayed and took up residence there. The yard was filled with beautiful flowers and many fruit trees. There were animals like chickens and dogs, which were frequent visitors to the plantation because they enjoyed the fruits that ripened and fell to the ground in the different seasons. Sue and Margaret often watered the garden to make sure that the plants grew tall and strong. The front lawn of the plantation was beautified by the plants which provided a sightseeing adventure for visitors and locals alike. The duo made pets of the strays and fed them well whenever they visited the plantation. They also sold ripe fruits like bananas, apples, plums, mangoes, avocados, and oranges in the local market in order to get money to pay Ralph the gardener for mowing the lawn. Monty was always pleased with how the plantation was well kept. He always promised to reward them for their generosity in volunteering to help him to take care of the monument that reminded him of the legacy of his parents and grandparents. When Monty was ill, Sue and Margaret took great interest in assisting him by preparing sumptuous balanced meals, getting medicines to give him relief from his distress and taking him for doctor visits. They continued to do chores in and around the mansion as customary. Monty was grateful. He was happy that he had Sue and Margaret as his family. He reassured them that he would be all right after a while and they would live happily together when he got better. All were hopeful. I do not think I will make it. Sue recalled hearing Monty say a few days before his passing. Her heart sunk, but she thought that it would be best if he died than to suffer in the way he did. She also thought that her family would inherit the plantation and continue to take good care of it since Monty had no next of kin. Monty was generous in life so he will be generous in death, or so they thought. Three weeks after Monty's burial, a store owner Monty's executor came to see Sue and Margaret at the mansion. 
They had already moved in and were getting settled. He was astonished to see them very comfortable in the mansion that belonged to him. Good day, Miss Margaret, said Mr. Wilkins. Hello, Mr. Wilkins, replied Margaret. I am surprised to find you in here. I went by your home to see you, and when I did not, I decided to come here to find you working in the garden or feeding the animals. Oh, replied Sue. We have come to reside here in the mansion to continue to take best care of the property like we did when Monty was alive. Ah, I see. However, I do not think you should be here. I have a document that Monty signed in my presence, a will. It will clear things up. Margaret was furious. Sue looked confused. Mr. Wilkins took a seat in the comfy leather sofa next to an antique piano that Monty once promised Sue. Mr. Wilkins began reading. Last will and testament. Be it known this day that I, Monty Fraud of 154 Sunshine Way, Santo Monica, being of legal age and is sound in mind and memory, and not acting under duress, menace, fraud, or undue influence of any person, revoke all former wills and testamentary dispositions made by me, and declare this to be my last will and testament. I appoint Conrad Wilkins to be sole executor of this will. I give unto the persons named below, if he or she survives me, the property described below. Name and relationship. Property description. Conrad Wilkins executor. The mansion and all that is in it. Susanna Poquito cousin. Two stray dogs. Margaret Hezekiah aunt. East Indian mango tree. Rolf Superton gardener golden dentures and water boots please note all persons listed above will have access to the property at their convenience to make sure that it is well kept like it was when i was alive disappointment distress gloom and rage etched on the women's faces they felt betrayed they were being used for so many years just to get nothing of substance for all their labor they were victims of empty promises and could not make sense of what was willed to them. How could he be so evil? He was the family's richest member who had everything to his disposal. Yelled Sue. Yes, how could he have been so selfish? How will we tell Rolf that he would receive golden dentures and water boots? This is simply ridiculous. Screamed Margaret. Stray dogs. Exclaimed Sue. I was promised the grand piano. Monty knew I played it well. Margaret struggled to hold back the hot stream of tears that flowed down her flushed cheeks. She thought of the East Indian mango tree. This time she would not let ripe fruits fall to the ground for the animals to partake. She decided to sell the fruits in the market and keep the money for herself and her family. By this time Mr. Wilkins got up and walked to the door. I'm sorry for the trouble, but please pack your things and leave my house before noon," said Mr. Wilkins to the women. He did not want them to get too comfortable there, as he was not planning to let them stay out of pity. I do not understand how the mansion was willed to you, Conrad, cried Margaret. You see, explained Mr. Wilkins. A few years ago, Monty and I became business partners owning and operating the common store on East Lane Plaza. Monty failed to keep his end of the bargain and ran into financial difficulties. He went bankrupt and I agreed to assist him financially and he decided to include me in the will to obtain the mansion. That explains it, sobbed Sue. Empty promises because he was broke may his soul find no rest. Do not say that, reprimanded Margaret. It is just unfortunate how things turned out. They heard a screeching sound at the front door. It was Ralph. When they told him what had transpired, he said, I've always admired those golden dentures and my pair of boots are worn. I am grateful for what I have received. He did not have to leave anything on the will for me. Sue, Margaret and Ralph burst out in laughter. They laughed so hard that tears flowed down their faces. Mr. Wilkins bid them goodbye but they did not even notice that he left. After a good round of laughter, Ralph helped them pack up their belongings, and they moved back to their small thatched house, where they considered making a better life with the millions of dollars.
they had after such an embarrassing ordeal. Thanks for watching. Remember to like, share and subscribe.